Deb Kometi, and I'll be your moderator for this class. Welcome to another lecture presented by the Syracuse, New York class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States and certain other foreign countries. The Syracuse branch was established in 1969. The dean of the Syracuse branch is Dr. Patrick Trevison. The president is Dr. Robert Welch. And the vice president is Dr. John Cometti. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would pr produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in this pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, he took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, which is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, 
and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity and Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning Ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. Now at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside class to say the prayer to dedicate our lecture. And then we will have our scripture, which is Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. That'll be read by Dr. Linda Volpe from Oceanside class. And the other reader for tonight will be Dr. Dave Frankowski, also from our Oceanside class. Good evening, everyone. Let us thank Yahshua the Messiah that he has allowed us to come to another place where the truth of him is being taught, where great things are being shown to them that love the truth. We ask that you still our minds from the thoughts of this world and the cares of everyday life and allow us to focus in on those things that you have prepared for us. This we ask in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 I will be reading from the King James Version of the Bible, and it's a Schofield edition, and I will be inserting the proper names where applicable. I'm reading Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he shall grow up before him like a tender plant, and like a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor, nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Yahweh, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? 
for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession intercession for the transgressors. That was Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller and Dr. Linda Volpe. And um, I'd like to let the class know that we're going to follow a three-speaker format. And um, we don't have the um, acknowledgement sign to go up. So we'll just be saying when um, the speakers have five minutes left. And uh, for our first speaker tonight, I'd like to call on Dr. Frank DeMassey. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Uh, This scripture uh, is is a prophecy of Isaiah. And what he's talking about is he's prophesizing Yahshua. This is 700 years before his birth. And he's prophesizing and he's showing the nature of both the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of righteousness. Before coming into class, I had no idea, you know, uh, when I would think of Jesus, I was I would think of Jesus as a uh, a good looking white guy with blue eyes. And, you know, uh, especially in my household and my family, my mom and dad, you couldn't go into a room and not have a picture of Jesus or or Mary in, in the room. And it was always glorified and beautiful. And, you know, until coming into this class and stand before this gospel, did I realize that, you know, the mystery of iniquity, all he can do is, is judge a cover or judge a cover by what it looks like. And it doesn't have any understanding of, of the essence of what's inside. And that's how Yahweh fools that mystery of iniquity because he can't get past a physical manifestation. He's got, he can only depend on what he sees with his with his, uh, with his carnal mind and physical eyes. But yet us, by grace and mercy, our eyes are open and, and we understand and recognize. And let's just start at the scripture and I'll try and see, try and explain what I'm, what I'm talking about. Just start right away at 53 and 1. Isaiah 53 and 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? Okay, stop right there because you know the arm of Yahweh revealed that it's just like who's gonna who's having the revelation. And this is all control. This is Yahweh's purpose. There's gonna be people who are gonna be able to see, and there's people who are just not gonna be able to see and understand Yahweh and Yahweh's purpose. Go ahead. For we have grown up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of the dry ground, he hath no form or comeliness. And when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He so you think dis- about it. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm not trying to be rude. I, I, just things pop into my mind and I got to get them out before I lose them. Uh, so, you know, what they're saying here. Is if he was if Yahshua when he came into the flesh, is he, if he was this glorified uh, Herculean Adonis, uh, you know, uh, it would be evident of who he was. But that's not how Yahweh, Yahweh works. You know, it, it's not going to be uh, 
that's what he's going to use to deceive the devil because that devil is going to get stuck right on that manifestation. It's not going to be able to see past that. But with Yahshua, when he's going to come in, he's going to be lowly. He's going to be, uh, what do they say, humbly. Read on. Read that again, please. Number two. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So, so a normal carnal mind is trying to look at, at that manifestation of a man and they're not going to think anything about it. And yet that's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And they're not going to be able to comprehend it or understand it because their eyes have been blind. But that's just Yahweh's purpose. And that's why us in class, if we see this gospel and we understand it and we, by our witnesses, by the law, by the prophets, by the creation, by a simple threefold pattern, if you see these things, your eyes have been opened, your heart has been converted and circumcised and your ears are open and you, and you hear. These are all things you didn't do. These are all things by grace that Yahshua inside of you has made you see and understand. And it's a, it's, it's a glorious gift. And all we can do is, is bow and be thankful of what we were able to comprehend and receive. So, you know, again, like, but the world, the world has Jesus as this glorious, you know, I, I had never understood because I lived in a neighborhood where, where there were uh, black people. And I, I always wondered, well, I wonder if, if they have a picture of Jesus in their house that he's black because, you know, we just, you're just, you're blinded. You didn't understand before coming into this class. That's what the devil does. He deceives. And, and again, it's by mercy and grace our eyes are opened and that mystery of iniquity has been exposed. And no more can he fool us by that physical manifestation. He can't do it. And it's not us that, that crack that that code or that that ability. That's Yahshua in us that opened our eyes to it. Okay, can we read on? Because this is more because this is all the things that not only how they treat him, but that's going to be the same because if they hated him, they're going to hate us because the same nature, the same attributes that was in him has been put in us. I'll read on. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Yeah, they wanted to kill him because he's, he's saying his name was Yahshua. Yahweh is salvation. And, and they're saying that he's a blasphemer. They say, well, if you, Yahshua said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And all the scribes and Pharisees and all the other Jews are, are looking at him and, and wanting to stone him, saying, how dare you? How dare you say that? Again, because their eyes were blinded. Uh, read on, please. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of Yahweh, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Okay, can I have that uh, um, the covenant chart? There it is. Now look at, he was bruised. See, see the, on the right side, you see the two covenants. On, on the right side, you're going to see that, that heart of flesh and principle, that spiritual covenant. And on the right or the left, you're going to see the carnal ordinances where are all physical, temporal things that they tried to do to be uh, reverent, but they couldn't, they couldn't keep the law. There was 10 commandments and 603 ordinances. And they couldn't keep any of them. And if you broke one of them, you broke them all. And the penalty of breaking them law, that law was death. But Yahweh, in his mercy, worked out a way in his purpose where through creating a tabernacle and creating an 
an altar of sacrifice that he allowed something to die in our stead. But now he's got to come in and he's going to be the supreme sacrifice. And that's him on the cross. And that's what he's doing. He is, everything that Yahshua is doing in the flesh is fulfilling. He is completing. He is nailing it to the cross. He did this for our, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. He conquered sin. And, and by mercy and grace, we understand and, and recognize what type of love that is. So what, all those physical court ordinances, all they did, they didn't make them perfect pertaining to their conscience. They always had a condemned conscience. But the great feat that the, what he did when he died and he suffered and he buried and he resurrected, and then 50 days later in, in Pentecost, now the same spirit that was in that man that they hung on the cross is now putting men on a permanent basis. And now there is the spirit in you now is eternal. There's no condemnation. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. And it's not you doing it. It's not thing you earned. It's not anything you deserved. It's only by grace and mercy. And if we understand that and see this and recognize it, all you can do is get on your knees and be thankful. And then once you receive it, now you have an obligation to spread the news, to, to, to share with others, and hopefully someone else will see the beauty and the understanding that you have, you can share with someone else. And you never know what soul is going to see and what soul is not going to see. Um, so that's all. He, he died and suffered the death of an outcast dog. They beat him. I always, every time I see a sunset and it's red, you know, before coming to class, you know, I had a different eye of, of looking at beauty. I, I just thought it, well, it was that pretty, but didn't know why. Now when I look and I see a, a, a red sunset, it saddens me, but it, it makes me appreciative of, of the understanding that I have because that sun is, was red. And that's what he was. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was red with blood. They beat him, again, like an outcast dog. And he went through those things to conquer and to nail all those ordinances to the cross. And now in this covenant, in this day, in this age, there's a spiritual covenant. All that old covenant that was nailed to the cross, we took, but there's principles that we learned from the old covenant that transfer over to the new covenant. See, the hardest thing to do is to recognize and realize that you were wrong. And that's when, when I came to class, um, I knew, I pretty much knew right away that uh, everything that I, I believed and everything that I was taught in church was pretty much wrong. But I wasn't uh, going to just go, uh, head over heels over this thing and I tried to avoid it because I knew that there was some sort of obligation because I realized before coming into class my only obligation was going going to church when I felt like it on Sundays and suffering for an hour and can't, couldn't wait to get out to go watch football that, that was my obligation but I knew coming into this class that there was some sort of obligation that I knew that once I, I was like getting into a relationship and I recognized that and I kind of at first kind of tried to get away from it. But, you know, I thought that, uh, that I was just blessed and lucky because my, my sister and my brother-in-law was involved in class and told me a lot about it, that that's how I was drawn in. But I recognized and realized that, you know, from the foundation of the world, each of us that are here, and understand this gospel, we were we were known before we were even created, before anything was created. He chose us. All right, I'm getting carried away. Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of all of us. 
See, that's and that's that old covenant. That's what that's how that's Yahweh's purpose unfolding. All right. There, there has to be darkness to understand light. There has to be misery to understand joy. There has to be hate to understand love. These are all things that have to occur and, and manifest so we can see not only the physical manifestation, but understand the principle behind it. Read on. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he yeah. opened not his mouth. Again, the nature of Yahshua, you know, why does they call him the lamb? You know, uh, I never understood that. I just thought because a lamb was white and pretty, you know, I didn't know anything when I was in, in Catholic Church. I, I just heard the Lamb of God. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about or understand the nature of a lamb or what a lamb was or anything about Exodus, the 12th chapter, or Passover, or any of that stuff. I didn't know. I had no idea. They didn't. The church never told you anything about it. The church just, just told you what to do and how to do it. Get up, sit down, kneel, give your money. Go home. And, you know, unfortunately and ironically, you know, this school, a better part of this school is doing the same thing now. And they don't even realize that they've turned this gospel of, of freedom and, and mercy and love into a gospel of blindness and obedience to a, a man instead of being led by their heart and by their conscience, they don't do that. They, they, they got to be, they got to have, they're like, again, it, it's like going back to church. They got to have somebody tell them what to do. Stand up, kneel, say this, say that. You know, uh, it's just disheartening to, to see. And all, you, all we can do is hope and pray that somehow in Yahweh's purpose that these people's eyes and ears uh, get converted and their hearts get converted and, and they recognize and, and realize the I don't want to I don't want to get too not trash just the misery that they're that they're trying to, to preach they they think that their quote unquote that their their future is rosy. I, I don't you know how can your future be rosy when your dependence is on a physical man? And that physical man is going to is going to be taken away from you. What are you going to just pass the buck until you know the last one dies? You're, you're you're stuck on a physical manifestation. Get past that and understand that it wasn't the man; it was the spirit in the man. You can't honor a man and not honor what the man says. It's, it's what's in him that was speaking the, the words. Those are spirit, and those are life. Those are the things that we should that should be recognized and, and, and be and admonished to to adhere to, not uh, not try and create a a class where you 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 dress up and and you you uh, do this and do that and then you press play and you sit down and shut up and listen. It's just, it's, 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 you're, you're right back to the old covenant. You're just right back to the old covenant. It's a physical way of worship. It didn't work then. It's, it's not going to work now. You know, again, you can only pray and, and hope. I mean, we would, we would open, open our arms gladly to any soul that would turn around from that and, and come back to their first and true love. But this is Yahweh's purpose, and all we can do is, is preach and teach what Yahshua has shown us and let the chips fall where they may and know that he is justice, he is mercy. Okay, where are we going? Uh, are we at seven? We're done at seven? Verse eight, yes. Yeah, was, so that's the nature of Yahshua. It's the same. When, when, so when he's going to be uh, crucified, What's his nature going to be? He's going to be the same as in, as the nature of a lamb. He's not going to fight it because he understands and recognizes that's what he came into this creation to do was to die. And here, 
uh, you know, we have to recognize where we are in, in this purpose. And we're, we're prophetic seconds away from having the universal revelation. And once Yahshua gets off that mercy seat, when Yahweh gets off that mercy seat, I should say, there's no mercy. There's no more mercy. You know, the world's waiting for Jesus to come again. You know, he's coming with a with flaming vengeance on them that don't know him. You know, uh, again, we just have to realize how blessed we are and how much comfort and strength that this gospel gives you, because. As, as crazy, the shootings are just getting more and more rampant out there. People are dying everywhere out of misery. And and we we know and understand that this creation is not out of control. This These things have to happen. It has to come. To, I remember Mitch always saying that this creation is, is like that Japanese fan. It's just got to it's gotta open up and open up and open up until it's complete. And that's what this purpose is. And, you know, about well, this physical creation, anyway, we, we're going to have three more ages yet to come be, and learn and understand and be in that body of Yahshua the Messiah. All right, let's, let's get to eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yeah, again, when, you know, we could go back in the Matthew, in, in the third chapter, and, and, you know, when Yahshua was being baptized and John saying, well, you know, John's doing a, a, a baptism of repentance. So that's, well, he's going to people and saying, well, have you sinned? And Yahshua is saying, well, no, you know, no, I haven't sinned. Well, John said, well, you should be baptizing me. But he said, well, it has to be so. So it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. And, you know, Yahshua, this covenant, we're, we're being baptized not let's get that Matthew three, three thirteen is it? Yes, Matthew three thirteen. Then cometh Joshua from Galilee to the Jordan unto John to be baptized by him, but John forbade him, saying, "I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me?" And Joshua answering said unto him, "Permit it to be so now." For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented to him. And Yahshua, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right. You know, this is things that he has to do to fulfill. But yet, the world, you know, they're still baptizing. They're thinking, well, it's got to be physical water, where we know and understand it. Physical water can't even clean your hands, let alone they're trying to clean the outside of your or their body. And this gospel, it'll do it to clean, clean you inside out, not outside in. You know, this, this gospel, when, once Yahshua, you know, we go to... Ezekiel or Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 36, he's causing you, he's changing you, he's changing your nature, he's changing the way you act, he's changing the way you think, he's changing your desires. All those things are occurring, and it's not of your doing. It's only by grace and mercy. Okay. Uh, I want to get to, go ahead, read on, please. Back to the scripture. Verse 10. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. See, it's a manifestation of, of philoprogenitiveness, an instinct of love of your offspring. 
And I, I always loved the manifestations of that principle when I would talk with, with especially people that have children. And I would tell them, well, you know, if you're in front of your house and your child is, runs in front of them in the, in the road and you see a car coming and that child's going to get hurt, are you worried in your heart, your first thought, are you worried that you're going to get hurt? Or your first thought is you got to go save your child. And they would always say, well, yeah, I'm going to go save my child. I said, well, that's the same, that, that's the final progenitor, that's the instinct of love of your offspring. That's the love that Yahshua has for us. It's the same, it's just the same manif or principle, just a different manifestation. You know, um, this is a gospel of hope. And when, when, you, when you hear from the other camp, the other side of this school, and the, the things that they're preaching, uh, you, you feel, you feel, I feel heartbroken. I feel sad, that, especially people that I knew that no longer, you know, when I first met them, uh, you know, the class was teaching what Dr. Kinley vision was and see to to this day how it's evolved to something that's not even recognizable to what was originally taught back then in in that day and it's it's just but i understand and recognize that this is yahweh's purpose and this is happening for us to show and realize and appreciate the gifts that we have and the ability to expose that mystery and not let that mystery overcome us. So, uh, listen, I think I'm just going to uh, give up the floor. Um, I hope I, I try to inspire people and, and make them realize and recognize the grace and, and the gift that we've received and how precious this gift of the understanding of Yahshua, the Messiah, and his purpose is. So with that, I'll give up the floor and all glory to Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Frank DeMassey. And our second speaker will be Dr. Kathy Heels from Cloudersport, Pennsylvania. Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me? We can. Yes, okay. we can. Um, I really love this chapter, and I really appreciated what Frank had to say. There were so many beautiful things brought out, and uh, he just kind of summed up Yahweh's purpose as a whole. In this scripture reading, you have both mysteries. You have Yahshua having the nature of lamb to die for our sins so that we could have his Holy Spirit and be one with him. And it's nothing that we did. This is totally by grace and mercy. I'm not going to be up too long. I just want to run a train of thought on something from this scripture reading that I've been thinking about. In Isaiah 53, 3. Isaiah Okay, I didn't know. Oh, he is despised Sorry. and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. See, Sir, Yahshua was despised. That's a very strong word. That, that means like hated. He was hated. Here's the most righteous being. The only righteous being in the universe manifests in the flesh and they hate him for what he is preaching. That that nature of righteousness. If, if you look at the two mysteries, the mystery of iniquity hates the mystery of righteousness. The mystery of righteousness is Trying, Yahshua is trying to show us the truth through the preaching of the gospel. That's why we come to class. He has drawn us to this teaching so that we can know him. And we come to class dead on arrival. And we have to be baptized in the living water of the gospel. 
until we have a revelation. And that's when Yahshua the Messiah is truly coming in your soul and taking over and causing you to take on his divine nature, his divine intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power, and strength. Not in totality, just in part. But the measure of spirit that is given to us makes us part of the body of Yahshua and we are one with our creator. And that's the greatest gift that we could ever, ever get. And it's not just for now. It's for the next age. We are being prepared in our souls to go into a new age where dwelleth only righteousness, peace, and joy. There will be no devil. We will receive an immortal glorified body. And it will be a new creation that's spiritual, not physical, not carnal, but spiritual. And that's how Yahweh has set his whole purpose up. He set up the natural for 4,000 years to show forth how he created the creation by a pattern. And he set up the law and the prophets by this pattern to point out the Savior so that we would know who he is when he manifested in the flesh. Uh, I think uh, Frank said 700 years after that prophecy that he was the lamb that was going to die and be hated. Well, the principle I want to run is that Yahshua was hated without a cause. And if we could just get, uh, just go to the law and the prophets and the fulfillment on it. That's, and I, I want to explain why they hate him so much. Um, let's go to Psalm 69 and 4. Psalms 69 and 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the, air, the hairs of mine head. Now, King David is a righteous king, and he has a pure heart before Yahweh. He, he's righteous in, in the purpose because Yahweh is using him. Like in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Well, David, he manifests a chosen righteous one, okay? And he said, I'm hated. They hate me without a cause. Now, let's go back into the law and into the prophets and, and flesh that out a little bit more and see and break that, open it up a little bit more. Let's go back to Moses in Numbers uh, 16th chapter, where Korah and Dathan have a problem with Moses. And I don't want to read the whole chapter, but you'll find that Kor and Dathan gathered together against Moses and Aaron and accused them of taking too much upon themselves. And, uh, yeah, 16. Verse, and yep, start at verse four. Okay. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spoke unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow, Yahweh will show you, show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. See, uh, Frank was talking about that lamb in the scripture reading. Moses is as a lamb here because he doesn't defend himself. He just hits the dust. He, he bows down to the ground. He's fearing for Korah and Dathan what's going to happen to them. And he says, let Yahweh decide. So, so. The point is, they don't like Moses. In verse uh, 9. Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that Yahweh Elohim of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? Keep going. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? That was the problem. Korah was seeking the priesthood also. He was a Levite to help the priesthood, but he wanted to be a priest. 
And Aaron was set up to be the priest. And he had a problem with this. And he hated Aaron and Moses. They were hated without a cause. They didn't do anything but give them Yahweh's words. They hated them. They would have liked to have killed them. So you see that principle of Yahweh's chosen or the righteous are hated without a cause. Can I have the elementary chart? And can we go to Numbers 13, 26? I'm just trying to show you in the law where the chosen are hated without a cause. And they're showing forth the mystery of righteousness. No Yahweh's verse. working with them. Start at verse 26. Verse 26. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They showed them the fruit of the land. Go ahead. There were, they, there were clusters of grapes that they had to carry on a pole because there were such big grapes and they had pomegranates. And uh, they showed them the witnesses of how this land was fruitful. Okay. And Yahweh promised that they could have their inheritance in Canaan's land. But Israel, because they were carnally minded and under the old covenant and the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out yet, they, they were against these spies that brought, that brought back this report. They didn't care about the witnesses. All they cared about is that they didn't think they could go over into Canaan land and take it. Keep going. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Here's the witnesses. Plus, you know, I mean, they're showing them the fruit of the land. This is the land of milk and honey that was promised to you through Abraham. Go ahead. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Anak were giants. And the Israelites that Yahweh delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage to Pharaoh, and that took out the lamb and put the blood on their doorposts. And they went through the Red Sea and led of the spirit into the wilderness following that cloud, which is a type of spirit. They're the ones that Yahweh is talking to here. They're the ones that are supposed to go over into Canaan land and receive their inheritance. And yet there's a problem with this first generation of Israel. And we know by the old covenant that Yahweh didn't give them a heart to know him and love him in Deuteronomy 529. So they're always murmuring. They're always having a problem with the creator because they're carnally minded. And Yahweh's using this pattern to take a carnal mind from death unto life. So it's possible to come into class carnally minded, dead on arrival and be baptized with the Holy Spirit and resurrected into the holy place and be enlightened and be able to see Yahweh's purpose and be fed with spiritual food and have direct intercession by the Holy Spirit within us to the Heavenly Father. See? So here we are. Keep reading. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites. Okay, that's well, good. Skip to 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. We are well able. Look what Yahweh just did for us down in Egypt. He overcame the mightiest king of the world. He plagued him, and he destroyed Egypt. He 
He was well able to overcome Pharaoh and his host. He's well able to overcome any army, any giant. And if, if there was a giant that they had already overcome, it was Pharaoh. So here these children of Israel are looking at the tribe in Canaan's land like giants, and they're scared. In spite of the fact that it is a land of milk and honey and Yahweh wants to give it to them, they're scared and they rebel. And Josh and Caleb stilled the people because they were they were upset. And he said, let us go up at once. And Joshua and Caleb brought back the true report of the spies from Canaan land. There was 10 false spies and two true reports. Okay. Two had the true report and 10 had the false report. Okay. There's those two mysteries again. Okay. Go ahead. 31. But the men that went up with him said, we we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They're considering themselves. A carnal mind considers themselves. See, because with if you consider the creator, he's in control of everything. All things are possible with the creator. Even though the nations are stronger than we. Go ahead. 32. Please. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. <clears throat> and so we were in their sight. Did they just forget what happened to them? I mean, they were slaves in bondage in Egypt, and Yahweh was able to deliver them from that, from Pharaoh, his great power that Yahweh raised them up with so he could overcome them. But they refused the true report. So now start 14.1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. They were discouraged. They didn't believe they could take Canaan land because they didn't believe in the creator. Go ahead. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, would Yahweh that we had died in the land of Egypt or would Yahweh we had died in the wilderness? And where and wherefore hath Yahweh Elohim brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Oh, my gosh. Crying to get out of there so bad. And now they want to go back down into Egypt. Wow. That's really bad. That's like us going back out into the world mm -hmm. to try to embrace their doctrine again, which are only lies. There's no way we can do it. Yahshua, through the preaching of the gospel, has told us the truth. And we cannot go back to a lie. We just can't do it. Skip down to uh, mm -hmm. verse 9 and 10. Only rebel not ye against Yahweh, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their it's a piece of cake. We're going to be able to overcome them. Go ahead. Their defense is departed from them, and Yahweh is with us. Fear them not. Don't fear them. Yahweh is with us. You don't have to be afraid of them. But they still were. Okay, this is what I want to get right here. Ten. But all the congregation demanded to stone them with stones. They were going to stone Caleb and Joshua for giving a true report. They hated them without a cause. They did nothing wrong. They hated them. They didn't like what they had to say. They hated them without a cause. And if you take a look at Joseph in Genesis 37, I mean, it comes right out in the book and says it. 
This is how Yahshua said that we should learn of him. We should go to the law, the prophets, and see how Yahshua fulfills by this pattern. And I use the migratory pattern to show you how that the righteous are hated without a cause. Okay, now let's get Genesis 47. We're still in the law. Or I mean, Genesis 37, my bad. One through four. And I got to kind of hurry because I don't have a lot of time. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Keep going. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. That's like Yahweh loved Yahshua more than everybody. Go ahead. And he made him a coat of many colors. Which shows and that he's clothed with the spirit in a type. Go ahead. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all the brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. See, but he didn't do anything wrong. Joseph is being hated without a cause. It's not his fault that his father loves him. He's being hated. They hate his guts so much so that they wanted to kill him and instead put him in a pit and then brought him out and sold him for money to Midianite merchant men that went down into Egypt and he ended up in prison. And you guys know the story about Joseph. He ended up uh, being Pharaoh's right hand man and causing Egypt to uh, have lots of food during the time of a famine and the whole world had to come to Egypt for food. But Joseph loved his brethren, even though they hated him. And when they came down to buy food, he took care of his brethren. He revealed himself to them and gave them the best land in Egypt and stuff. But he was hated without a cause by his own brethren. That's scary. Same thing with Moses. Hated without a cause by his own brethren. If you look at Noah. Do you think the world loved Noah for preaching the gospel that it's going to rain and the whole world is going to be drowned out with a flood and you better turn to Yahweh and forsake your way and turn to Yahweh and be saved and get in the ark? Listen to this gospel. In Second Peter, the third chapter, Noah was scoffed at. There was scoffers coming in the last days at the end of that age that first stage in the time in the realm of time at the end of that age with the flood they hated noah they did not like to hear the creation was going out and that they had to forsake their way and go into the ark they don't they just hated him and he didn't do anything wrong so they're hating him without a cause now let's go into the prophets go to daniel the sixth chapter One, I think around four, I think. Daniel 6 and 4. Uh, start at 3. Daniel was over the presidents. The King Darius loved Daniel. And he preferred him above all, all his high men. Verse 4. Daniel 6, 4. I'll read it. I have it. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. They were trying to find occasion against him. They hated him without a cause. They're jealous. I mean, there's a lot of causes, but he didn't deserve to be hated. He's hated without a cause. Now let's go into uh, 2 Chronicles 36 
In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, holy men of Yahweh, down through the law and the prophets, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I pay, paraphrase that. But the, the righteous prophets that were sent to Israel, they were hated without a cause. They were killed. Uh, many of the prophets were killed by the Jews. They did not want to hear from the prophets. They were hated. Okay, let's go to Dan, uh, Daniel, the sixth chapter, fourth verse. Oh, I just read it. Daniel's hated without a cause. Okay, and you'll see how that he manifests righteousness because there, there was a degree that nobody was to pray to their God for 30 days. And Daniel opened up his windows and he didn't care who saw him. He loved Yahweh and he didn't care what they did to him, but they hated him. They hated him without a cause. Second Chronicles 36. Does somebody have that? 14. And let's like get it in the scripture reading, Isaiah 53, 1 through 4. Uh, first, before Chronicles? No, you can go Second Chronicles 36, 14. Yeah, sorry, on the prior, I was muted by accident. Oh, that's okay. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgress very much after all the abominations of the nations and polluted the house of Yahweh which he had how which he had hallowed in Jerusalem, and Yahweh Elohim of their fathers. I want it. Them. I want it where it says they killed the messengers. Is it mm -hmm. before that thirty seven one? Or I mean, hang on thirty six. Uh, maybe eleven. Second Chronicles thirty six. Let me go there. Okay, sorry, I'm looking. Thirty six. Oh, it's uh, 15, 15 and 16. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And Yahweh Elohim of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up early and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. These are those in Second Peter 1, 20 and 21, holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to Israel. Go ahead. But they mocked the messengers of Yahweh and despised his words. And misused his prophets until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people. See, so they hated the, the prophets. They mocked them. They abused them. They hated them. So now, Yahshua's got to fulfill this. Because what we're seeing is the two mysteries. The mystery of righteousness is full of love. And the mystery of iniquity is full of hate. And it's for the truth. This is all about the truth. In John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that you might know thee, O Yahweh, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. It, this is about Yahweh's truth. The creator is real. He has a purpose, pattern, and a plan. And he loves us to lay up all these witnesses so at the proper time after Yahshua the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection in the fulfillment of the law and the prophets to atone for our iniquity, he pours out his Holy Spirit and he allows us to see his truth. This is all about his Holy Spirit of truth. That's why we're coming to class. We want to know the truth. And like J Joshua said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and it shall make you free. I want just a regular elementary. Thank you. Now let's go to uh, Matthew, the 15th chapter, I think it is. Yeah, no, John, the 15th chapter. And start, pick it up at 18. Now, Yahshua's fulfilling. And one, see, the reason that we go back to the law and the prophets by the pattern and know that they're pointing to Yahshua, that he must fulfill, is to show you of his spiritual nature. See, this is Yahweh Elohim manifested in the flesh. 
It says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yahweh and the word was Yahweh. And then in John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and what? Truth. Yahshua has the truth. That's what we're after, the spirit of truth. That's what's going to set us free from Satan's lies, Satan's deception. He had us all deceived because we did not know the truth before we came into class. We were fooled by all the doctrines in the world in our own imaginations. Okay, let's go to John 15, start to 18. John 15, 18. Yep. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated you're, me before it hated you. You're um you're kind of uh I, your voice is bending. A little distorted, yeah. Yeah, yeah distorted. I'm just in trouble with the Wi-Fi. Sorry. Would you read that, Linda? I got it. If the world hate you. Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Hey, if the world hate you, it hated me before it hated you. Why? Because you have the same, you're going to have the same spirit in you. And at the time, they were Yahshua's disciples and they cared, they loved him and they followed him around and they believed in the same things that he did. He was teaching them the truth and they embraced it. In fact, when many people were falling away, when Yahshua said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, many people fell away, but the disciples didn't. They said, where else are we going to go, seeing that you have the words of eternal life? That's in John 6, 73. But the world hated Yahshua, so it's going to hate you. Go ahead. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. See, we're not of the world. And nobody down through the scriptures that's manifesting righteousness is really of the world. Noah wasn't of the world in the iniquity that was going on in the world. He was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. And what Yahweh wanted for his people, the children of Israel, was to manifest a righteous son that would be in the midst of pagan nations, but they were not of them. But Israel couldn't do that because they were carnally minded. And Yahshua had to cast off that carnal nature and elevate their soul so that they could receive the promise. And in the type of Canaan, in the type, the children of Israel resurrected into the wilderness. And that first generation was dropped off because they they hated the truth. They they hated God. They hated Yahweh's chosen without a cause. But that second generation that was raised up in their stead after the first generation fell away after 40 years, they're the ones that went over and received Canaan land because they received the truth. Okay, keep going. And they were in the world, but not of it. Okay, go ahead. But because ye are not of the world, let me start again. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I've chosen you, just like Frank was saying. He chose us from the foundation of the world. There's no way he's going to lose us. In fact, he's been with us all our lives. We haven't had the Holy Spirit. But he has watched out for us. He has girded us all our lives. He knows who are his. We don't. That's why we preach the gospel to every creature, hoping and praying that they will be a chosen one of Yahweh to be part of his body by receiving his Holy Spirit of truth. Keep going. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his master. If if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Mm -hmm. If they, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Mm -hmm. But, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Right. They don't know the truth. Go ahead. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. 
If I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this wow. Time, They've hated both me and my father. Go ahead. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hated me without a cause. He's fulfilling. And he's not kidding. The world hates righteousness. The world hates the truth of Yahweh. In Romans, the 10th chapter, Paul said that they have a zeal of Yahweh, but not according to knowledge. They don't know the truth. And when they hear it, those who are not of Yahweh, they hate it. They hate Yahshua. They hate his father. And he said it's because he's fulfilling. Read the 26th verse. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, who proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Even the spirit of truth, he shall testify of me. And you know what? At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, after Yahshua died for our sins, was buried, nailed that old covenant to the cross, was buried and resurrected a life-giving spirit, and tarried for 40 days in his resurrection, and then he ascended. And 10 days later, he came back on the day of Pentecost and put his spirit in those disciples in the, in the 120 in the elevated room. And now they have the spirit of truth in them, and the world hates them too. See? And now you and me, if you take this migration, because it takes our picture. Israel is a type and shadow of our migration from carnal to spiritual. We are, as Israel, we were in bondage to the devil that rules this earth plane. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's the God of this world. And in 2 Corinthians 4.3, he has blinded the minds of them that believe not. We were dead in bondage to the devil's lies. And we have been brought to class. Yahshua has invited us. He drew us here. We didn't get here on our own. Frank Hammer. Okay, thank you. Frank Hammer, how that is by grace and mercy that we're saved. But we were dead and Yahshua died for us. And we're buried in the living water of the gospel. And Yahshua is revealed in us through that. When you see something for sure about Yahweh, about spirit, that's Yahshua in you. And he causes you to be resurrected. And there's a change in the holy place as we grow. That old nature that you used to manifest dies away. Your soul is elevated and born again to manifest the same image of the creator. See, now that the Holy Spirit is in you, you are going to preach this gospel of truth. And since the world doesn't like to hear the gospel of Yahshua, they're going to hate you. And Peter said, Marvel, or John, in First John, third chapter, marvel not that the world hates you. The bottom line, why? Does the world, in the mystery of iniquity, hate the mystery of righteousness? It's because of the truth. They really hate the truth. When Kor and Dathan were fighting against Moses, they hated the truth that they couldn't be the high priest. That Korah couldn't be the high priest. When those, uh, the ten false spies that went over, they hated the truth that there were giants in the land and that uh, Joshua and Caleb said we could take it. They didn't believe it. They hated the truth. At the time of Noah, they hated the truth. Only eight souls were saved during the prophets. They hated the truth. Now go to John, the 14th chapter, and this will be, I, I didn't get it in Isaiah, but we read it. 
that Yahshua was despised and rejected. He was hated. But I'm trying to tell you that without a cause is because he doesn't deserve to be hated. But the true underlining reason for the hate is because of the truth that he's speaking. Now go to John 14, 15 through 20. Quickly. Wow. I'm reading it. I'm just going to read it. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world hates the truth. They can't receive the truth. And it's in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 because they received not the love of the truth. If Yahshua has chosen you, you will receive the love of the truth. You'll love this truth when you hear it. It will make a difference. It will change your soul. It will convert your soul to righteousness by the Holy Spirit within ruling your consciousness. Okay, go ahead. Whom, oh, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And he was in them on the day of Pentecost. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world sees me no more, but you see me. That's because we're in the holy place with the Holy Spirit. Even though the world hates us, we are in Yahshua. We are in the truth. And we, are, we have love in us. We have love for the souls of this world. We don't want anybody to go to the lake. So we preach the gospel to them because the spirit of truth is in us. Verse 30, he said, or verse 20, at that day, you shall know that I am in my father and you and me and I and you. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. We received the Holy Spirit and we resurrect into a whole new way of life. Our soul is resurrected unto righteousness by that spirit of truth. And all we can do now is preach the gospel so that someone else's soul might be saved by hearing the true gospel from the Holy Spirit of truth, because he's doing the teaching. I hope you got something out of it. All glory and praise to Yahshua. Don't worry if people hate you. Yahshua loves you, and that's all that counts. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Hules. Our last speaker tonight will be Dr. Diane Emler from our Oceanside, California class. We're here, actually. Just hard to get unmuted. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, it's good to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm ashamed to say um, that I am laid up once again, <laughs> um, but coming uh hopefully around uh to uh uh getting through this current difficulty um, we can talk about all that later but i've enjoyed class uh i missed the uh first parts of class um but uh, I want to speak for a moment about um, the Chicago uh, get-together. Uh, for those of you who were not there, um, hopefully you've uh, taken advantage of the entire seminar being on uh tape uh on youtube and that's at uh chicago uh north side has uh the entire weekend it was um 
a very nice seminar. And I say that uh, as sincerely as I can. It was um, every speaker that got up, I felt, um, spoke from the heart. Um, there was no uh, divisiveness. There was no, um, I'm talking about this subject because I don't like the lecture you gave on it or any kind of uh, controversy or discord at all. It was all from the heart and the uh, a topic for the seminar was um, why was it why you should stand in the holy what place? Is, what is, what is. No, I don't think it was. Who what remembers? does it mean to stand in the holy place? What does it mean to stand in the holy place? And Kathy wasn't even there. I don't think. <laughs> So thanks for that. And it was, everybody uh, spoke on the topic. And it was uh, encouraging. Uh, because the first thing that you must know about this uh, tabernacle, which uh, the holy place is talking about, um, the holy place, meaning, um, there it is, uh, meaning uh, this tabernacle, which is an explanation of Elohim or the word of Yahweh. Um, and as Moses was given the... Um, uh, instructions for building this tabernacle and also um, the operation of the priesthood officiating within this structure. Um, this uh, structure was built in the wilderness of Sinai when the children of Israel came up out of Egypt. Um, and there, it was constructed uh, with, uh, at the very top, the most holy place, then the holy place, and then the court roundabout. In Daniel, it talks or in Matthew, it says that when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. And Daniel did speak of it. Um, and to get to the holy place, you have to get first get through the court roundabout. So the court roundabout, when it's uh, correlated to our body, shows the large intestine where there's constant burning and there uh, at each uh, um, corner on the altar, uh, there was a horn and there were uh, blood placed on the horn, and that showed the, um, um, I'm sorry, that shows uh, in the uh, um, intestine, uh, the colic arteries, um, there was a constant burning of an innocent sacrifice. Uh, the people would offer sacrifices when they sinned so that the 
sacrifice would die and they would not. And that's exactly what we do to live. Uh, the fruits, the vegetables, the meat, uh, whatever it is that you're consuming, um, didn't uh, sign up to be your sacrifice. <laughs> It was just chosen by someone, and that's what you prepared, and that's what you ate, and that's what keeps you alive. And in the same way, when you look at that altar, that is also um, showing forth uh, the Messiah, whose true name is Yahshua. For he was the sacrifice uh, for all mankind. And he was the only one uh, who was found innocent without blame, without spot, without blemish. Uh, I find no fault in him. Yahshua was without sin. And then uh, John, uh, the immerser or the Baptist, said that, um, behold, that Yahshua was the Lamb of Yahweh to take away the sin of the world. Uh, so as there's four points of blood here, maybe we should just go to the elementary chart. All right, thank you. So right in the center section, uh, you'll see the tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai. And uh, there you go, I think. Oh, good. Right next to it, the tabernacle and those four points of blood on the altar. Uh, and we already showed how that shows forth your intestines. And here with um, Yahshua, uh, remember John points him out as the Lamb of Yahweh. That makes him the innocent sacrifice. And uh, he was crucified on that cross with a crown of thorns around his head. And so he was nailed at the hands. No, stay right here because we're going to keep moving. So just blow her up a little bit there. Thank you. Um, so you have there uh, a crown of thorns on each hand. Uh, he was nailed and uh, at the feet nailed and the crown of thorns. That makes up four points of blood uh, with the innocent sacrifice. Now, we're going to go to the left a couple squares, and over right here, we're going to go uh, the children of Israel in Egypt. Uh, before they built this sacrifice, they uh there was the institution or the beginning of the Passover feast, and Israel had to once again take off an innocent lamb, and that lamb uh, had the blood drained, and they took the blood of that lamb and put it at the top of their doors, the two side posts of their door, and the basin of blood down at the bottom of the door, making four points of blood. And um, once they consumed that lamb totally, um, they left Egypt, but they left because they had the blood on the door, because 
uh, the death angel was to pass over Egypt. And um, if you had that blood, you shall you would be saved. And so that's the sacrifice of that lamb there again. Um, you can also see one more to the left of that. You have a depiction of Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac was a son given to Abraham in his old age. And Yahweh uh, told Abraham to offer up his son. His son did nothing wrong. He was innocent. But uh, Abraham uh, uh, had to obey uh, what Yahweh commanded him to do. And so when he uh, took that boy, uh, um, Isaac, um, walked him up on uh, a hill, and um, Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice the same way as the women in Egypt carried the kneading boards on their back the same way as the priests would have to bring the wood for the altar in the tabernacle as much as Yahshua had to carry his own cross. And as they took that three-day journey, then uh, in, in Abraham's mind, he thought that um, Isaac would surely die, but he knew Yahweh would resurrect him. And when Abraham uh, got to the place of the sacrifice um, and Isaac rightfully questioned, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham, Yahweh will provide sacrifice. And when Abraham took his knife to slay his son, then the angel came and stayed his hand. And there was a ram, which is a full-grown lamb, caught in the thickets by his horns. And that thickets uh, uh, where uh, he was caught in his head, the same as Yahshua had that crown of thorns around his head. And you can read where Jonah, when he was thrown overboard, his head was wrapped in weeds or had the uh, thicket or weeds wrapped around his head. And so this uh, uh, Isaac, was spared and the ram was offered up. But you have to see that Abraham already had him dead and buried in his mind. And now you know why Yahshua had to be uh, there in Gold, uh, uh, Golgotha, um, which is the place of the skull which is where Yahshua was dead and buried in the place of the skull. Um, so um, going back over to the tabernacle, you'll see that there had to be that sacrifice. And the next thing in your tabernacle, we need to go back. Thanks, Peg. Um, I know I'm not doing anything normal, so don't try. <laughs> so, so we've got here um, that Yahshua was, uh, or I'm sorry, we're back at the tabernacle. So we have the labor of water, the next thing, um, Yahshua. 
of course, uh, being baptized or immersed by John, you have here um, with um, uh, the children of Israel, they came through the Red Sea. You have that ram being shown as the true sacrifice with Abraham, and that um, came at the third day, just as they came through the Red Sea at the third, uh, um, and how that, um, uh, of course, it's through that baptism, he was 30, or on the third, he was baptized. So, um, you also had in the tabernacle the um, um, holy anointing oil, and that holy anointing oil is showing forth Yahweh or spirit. It's a quickening, it's a life-giving spirit. So, um, we know that when Yahshua was actually put on that cross, he was buried in that tomb and resurrected up on the third. And that's that sign of that quickening because he did not resurrect a physical body. He resurrected a quickening spirit. And the whole world has got him coming up out of the grave the same way that he went in, a flesh and blood body. What would be the point of taking the seed and putting it in the ground and watering it and having it come up a seed again? Nothing, nothing resurrects the same as it went in. Israel went in slaves and came up free men. Uh, uh, Isaac went in there to be killed and came up alive. And this Yahshua resurrected a quickening spirit. Now, when you go through all of that, you finally come into the holy place and in the holy place of this tabernacle, you have that uh, uh, lampstand, seven branches. You have a uh, shoe bread with uh, uh, 12 loaves of bread. You have an altar of incense, and that incense um, is where prayers in, in uh, prayers being the intercession for Israel. And so this is showing forth all that took place before and all that will take place going forward. It is a pattern of your creator and it will not change because he does not change. And he created this creation and gave uh, uh, visions and revelations to patriarchs and to uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Kinley, our founder, not to make those men great, but to see the creator, to see Yahshua, and that he is real, and that he is in you. I was taught in church about this Jesus and how he was on a cross, and then he wrecked it, but then was it. According to my Presbyterian upbringing, I was still sinning. I still had to go to church. I still had to feel bad for every bad thought I had. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me because when, where is uh, uh, the change? What has happened? What 
uh, um, can I look forward to? And the what you can look forward to is that spirit that resurrected up out of that tomb, spent 40 days in his resurrection, and then ascended. And 10 days later, all the boys and women were in the upper room on that day of Pentecost. Yeah, you can go ahead and scoot. Uh, there on that day of Pentecost. And on that day of Pentecost, they were filled, and I said filled, with the Holy Spirit. What get me, um, John 14? I want 26, but pick it the train of thought up a little. <laughs> and no, you can't go to one. And is anybody there hearing me? Yeah, John right. 14 and uh, maybe 21. Okay, he that. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Read. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Master, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Yeah, it's a good question. You're going to, you know, how are you going to show us? You're not going to show the world, but you're going to just show us. How do you do that? Go ahead. Yahshua answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words mm -hmm. and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, who's the we and what are we doing? Pick that back up that last verse. Uh, if a man love me, he will keep yeah. my words, and my father will love him. Okay, and we stop, will... stop, stop, stop. If, if a man loves me and keeps my word, read. And my father will love him. But then my father will love him, read. And we will come unto him. And we, who's the we? Joshua and the Father. I see. So we <laughs> will come unto him, read. And make our abode with him. And we will make our abode with him. We're talking about the Father and the Son. Now, I don't have time to give a Godhead lecture right now, but you need to see that Yahweh is spirit, and we all, including the Son, live, move, and have our being within spirit, and we never left. We have never left the Father. The Son has never left the Father. It's not like we're, we went off and did something by ourselves. This is still we. We will abide with him forever. Go ahead and read, because otherwise I won't make any sense. Go ahead. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Now... Those that do not love me will not keep my saints. That goes without saying. Uh, Yahshua came and said he fulfilled. The world says he instituted. Uh, he said he raised a quickening spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. And yet the whole world has got him resurrected a physical body. He said that he came to them on the day of Pentecost, and the whole world is standing around, still waiting for him to jump out of a cloud somewhere. 
They have not, they are confused because they will not believe what he has said. And we were told that this was such a mystery, we could never understand it. And we believed that. And so we truly have, w- did not listen to what he said. Now, granted, he has to open your eyes and ears to do that. But they just plain do not listen. And when you tell them repeatedly that his name is precious to him, then they still want to call him the Lord, which means nothing. See, they still want to say he instituted or began a Christian way of life. How was he going to start a Christian way of life? And the men that he's speaking to are Jews. And I want you to see that it, what they have taught us does not even begin to make sense. Go ahead and read, Linda. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, he's talking, talking, talking. And he says, now, the words that you hear are not mine. Listen, he is the word of Yahweh. In John 1.1, 1, 1, don't go there. In the beginning was the word, the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. All things were made by him, and without him is not anything made that was made. 14th verse, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He has the word, it's in a separate Entity to have his own words, he is the word of the Father. So the words you hear are the Father's. Go ahead. These things have I spoken unto you, being present with you. But the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit. Now that Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, Read, whom the Father will send in my name. Who the Father will send in my name. What is the name of the Holy Spirit? If the one speaking is Yahshua, the Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name then the name of the Holy Spirit is Yahshua. Do you know that they do not know the name of the Holy Spirit in the world? Why? Because they don't believe him when he said, the Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name, and they don't believe him. And that finishes out that uh, uh, um, he shall teach you all things. And then people sit there like idiots after he says he will teach you all things. And then you tell me about some man that taught you. Well, which is right. The some man that taught you. For Yahshua, who says he will teach you all, all things. It's just so simple. And yet, without Yahshua opening your eyes to see, you understand? You're blind. And you're deaf. And you're dumb. 
and the miracles we need now are eyes to hear, or eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to think, a mouth to speak. In all these things, we have been given this life to hear him, to see him, to think of him, to speak of him. And there's no other reason, just none. In the wilderness of Sinai, oh, I can't do that. In this holy place, Yahshua said, I am the light of the world. And in that holy place is that light. He said, I am the bread of life. And in that holy place is that bread. And he said, I am the only intercessor between man and Yahweh. And he is that prayer. He is that prayer. See? You have to go through a death, burial, and a resurrection before you ever get into the holy place. So if you know where the holy place is and what it is and what's in there for you, see, then stand in that holy place. When you see the desolation, and the desolation is going on this night. He has brought the children of Israel into the wilderness to prove them. Um, Deuteronomy um, uh, 8. 8. Yep. Eight and one, thanks. Eight and, and one. Then, yep. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land in which I always swore to give unto your fathers. Go ahead. And thou shalt remember all the way which Yahweh thy Elohim led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to test thee, to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. Well, I guess we found out it, Yahweh didn't have to prove to himself right. what Israel's heart was. He had to prove it to them. Mm -hmm. And I dare say he has proven, proven it to us. That we know without a new heart, without a new mind, we are lost. So um, let me just get uh, Psalms. It's Psalms 34, 17, and then I'll be over. 17, the righteous cry and Yahweh heareth. And delivereth them out of all their troubles. Now listen to this. The righteous will cry. And he will hear it. And mm -hmm. deliver you out of your troubles. Read. Yahweh is near unto those who are of a broken heart. And saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Now, he's going to save those of a broken heart. 
And I'm not talking about a heart that's been smashed down from Mount Sinai. I'm talking about a humbled heart, a broken heart. What breaks your heart? It breaks your heart when you see those who once knew Yahshua beat him up so badly that when they speak of Yahshua, he is unrecognizable. It breaks your heart when you know you have been displeasing. And of a contrite spirit. Do you know a contrite spirit? Check it in Strong's. It means to be crushed to powder. That's the contrite spirit. Pick it up and read it again. In 18, Yahweh is near unto those who are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Keep reading. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now, listen, I, I'm going to make you go word for word. <laughs> Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Read. But Yahshua delivereth him out of them all. Stop. Yahshua delivers the righteous out of it all. Because, read. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. He delivers us up out of our troubles, our whatevers, because he keepeth his bones, not one of them is broken. Now you know why a bone of his cannot be broken broken his body will not be broken his body will not do you understand just fade away because we're so few in number no he keepeth all his bones not one of them is broken and you can read down uh, and finish that off on your own time. Um, and I like to uh, say thank you and uh, hand it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Diane Emler. And that concludes our class. I'd like to uh, read the doxology to end the class, it's taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let the class all say, Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.